Gogo is a company that offers uh, internet on the flight. So, you know, most of our uh, most of our bigger plans are Delta and Delta are United. So, if, if you get a chance to fly one of those, you know, you might as well see our back there. Um, as a data scientist, um, the kind of problems I'm working on are uh, the huge volume of data that we have trying to identify patterns of device failure uh, so we can tell the business when is the right time to replace that device from the aircraft. Right? So that's, that's some of the problems that I'm currently working on. All right, so today we're gonna to talk about machine learning. Right? How many of you know anything about machine learning? Okay, so. So we will quickly see what machine learning is and why we even need it. Um, different types of machine learning algorithms, just, just high level overview of what kind of problems they can be applied to, um, how companies are using machine learning problems to solve their business problems, and uh, when is the right time to hire a machine learning data scientist and how machine learning data scientists can actually add value uh, to the company. So, what is machine learning? There is this huge buzz around machine learning, data science, data mining, most of them, most of these terminologies are used interchangeably. So what's this all about? Wikipedia says, machine learning is the ability to learn from data without being explicitly programmed. But wait a second. The explicitly programmed is something we've been hearing for years together, right? That's how all our expert systems work. That's how all our rule-based systems work. And they've been serving us for a while now just fine. So why do we need machine learning, right? Rule-based systems, again, you know, if, if X do Y, and we can do a sequence of those, and then there's a solution. Right. so let's try to apply the same rule-based system to identify and see if this picture is of a dog, right? So how do we initially come up with rules, right? Okay, dogs have four legs. Dogs in this picture is white. And dogs have fur, right? So if we give these rules to, to a machine learning algorithm, guess what it comes up with? You guys curious to see? All right. Three, two, one. <laughs> it has four legs, it's white in color, and it's made up of fur, right? Some of you might say, oh, you didn't add a rule for eyes and nose, right? <laughs> right? So, does this mean that we cannot come up with a with, with set of rules to, identify, to make a dog detection system? No, you can't. Think about how many thousands of rules you have to come up with to cover all sorts of scenarios. Right? And then, what if you go wrong, or even if one rule is out of place? A rule-based system works sequentially. Right? So even if one of them is out of place, your logic is screwed up. And then, what if your data changes at a faster pace, or your scenarios change at a pace faster than you can update your rules? Let's say you found a way to address all these. What happens after you build this, this immense, huge system for detecting dogs? And now I tell you, wait, that's fine. Now I want a system to, to identify food, not dogs. So all that logic you build essentially can't be reused because it was a set of logic pertaining only to that specific case. So instead of building a system that recognizes dogs, why not we build a system that learns to recognize dogs, right? That way, if you have to recognize food, we would just give it the pictures of food and then it will learn depending on whether you data it is. And that is exactly machine learning. You are learning from data and not explicitly programming it. So, broad categories of machine learning here. Um, supervised and unsupervised. So when I say supervised, you know the outcome of, of, the, of whatever entity you're predicting. 
not at the time of predicting, but later, so you can cross-check and see whether your prediction is correct. Right? But in unsupervised learning, you don't have an output variable. So you kind of don't know um, what, 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 you're, what you're predicting. Right? So the, the patterns should reveal themselves. So we, we will see an illustration of how that works. All right, so say you have a 10-year-old kid. You, sh you, you make your kid learn how different fruits look like. And then you take the kid to a supermarket, right? And show the kid this picture. What do you, th what do you think the kid might come up with as a label for this? Apple, right? Good, because you made the child learn how apple looks like. So now the child knows how it looks like assign a, bit, a label to it. Similarly, banana, right? Even though it's, it's a little different from what you've shown, but overall, you, you, you've made the child learn how banana looks like. So when you have labels to your output variable, and then you know the output variable, that is what is supervised learning. If you took the same child, and you didn't, you didn't tell them anything at home, you didn't, didn't show any pictures of any fruits, and still took took the kid to the supermarket and said, just, just group the fruits into different groups based on colors. So, and, so all, the, all the fruits of the same color should be in one group. Let's say, that's, let's say that's the task. And this is what the child does, right? So they group based on, based on color. And this is unsupervised learning. You don't know whether this is an orange or this is, this is pears. You just know that they're similar in some ways. And the similarity actually gives you those those, those groups. Right? So that is unsupervised. Uh, one of the most popular uh, supervised technique is regression. It's essentially um, say your your salary and experience. Uh, this kind of distribution, right? So the higher your experience, the more your salary. Right? So it's essentially coming up with a with a line. Or a model, linear model, such that your the difference between your actual points, which is so these are your actual points, right? And this is the line that you're predicting, which then becomes your predictions. So the difference between this and this, sum of all the differences between the actual points and the predicted points, then that is minimum. That is considered your best linear regression model. Did everybody kind of understand? So you want to make sure that you come up with a with an equation of a line such that the error between your actual value and your predicted value is the same. And it's it's just like the equation of a line, right? Y is equal to an x plus c. How salary is a constant plus some kind of coefficient and then the variable. So the way to interpret this is for one unit of change in experience, the uh, salary would change by V1, by the quantity V1. That's how you interpret it. And again, uh, regression is always uh, used for predicting continuous responses. That is, uh, you know, what will be the temperature to it's a continuous way, right? Uh, what time uh, will the game start tomorrow, right? So continuous values. For predicting continuous values, you use regression. When you come to classification, you're predicting discrete responses, meaning categorical variables, you know? Class A or class B, yes or no. So things like, will LeBron James win the MVP this year? You know, yes or no, kind of. You know, will it rain tomorrow? So yes or no. So there, those are categorical variables, and when your data has those categorical variables and your output is a categorical variable, then you can apply classification. So essentially, classification is nothing but learning uh, boundaries that can separate categories of your data. So here, in this picture, you see essentially distribution of three classes, and if you had to come up with boundaries, uh, logical boundaries, that is, two classes, and another is this, because it's separating the class B from class C. 
Suppose there is a new point that comes up, right? Let's say this is the new point. Now you're able to <coughs> assign a class to this library based on the based on the bound, right? So depending on where this point falls, you can assign a class to it. Right? If it if it were in the red zone, you would assign a class A and you know similarly. So that's how you will predict the value of uh, new observations. Based on the based on the trained data that that you shape your model. So yes. Okay. So for classification, the output is going to be in the search class for regression. The output is going to be in the base. Right. Uh, what about the inputs? Does it also have to be? No. The inputs can be anything. For both of them. Yeah. Okay. yeah. It's it's more dependent on the on the target variable that you're trying to predict. And again, there is there is a lot of pre-processing steps that you can do to the input too. You can convert them to all zeros and ones, or you can scale them. Uh, you know, these are all pre-processing steps that can be done. Right. So how do you know that the class that you predicted is correct? Right? Since since in uh, supervised learning technique you know the actual output, you can compare what the actual output is versus what your model predicts. So if your model predicts that it is true and your action class was also true, then it becomes a true positive. So you can build this confusion matrix of the sort to see uh, whether your how what percentage of the time your model is correct. So those were the two supervised machine learning techniques where we know the target weight. Uh, the most popular unsupervised technique is clustering. So again, here there is, there is no target variable. But just like in the, in the fruits example that we saw, you are coming up with groups of objects such that uh, the, the points in this group are more similar to this group than the points in another group. So they are similar within the cluster and dissimilar between the clusters. That's, that's how you come up with the groupings of these uh, uh, data points. Another unsupervised uh, famous technique is association, where uh, you're trying to find frequently co-occurring associations among uh, a collection of items. Right. So in transaction, so you see in the first four transactions, tomatoes and I think beer are very frequent. So you can compute metrics like support, confidence, and lift to see how uh, how how frequently these items occur together. And the classic example of uh, of this is you know market basket analysis. Uh, often we find that in, in grocery stores there are items which are you know which are put close to each other or grouped each other or sold as as you know as a unit because they they know that and they have observed that these items occur frequently together. And so the chances of you buying that combined unit is much higher because they now have proof. Yeah. Is this the form of unsupervised machine learning? It is, yeah. Because you don't know the target variable, right? You're just find, trying to find objects which are similar, which co-occur. You don't necessarily, uh, you're not necessarily predicting if, if this is a tomato or if this is a Sure. So support is uh, how many number of times this this particular event occurs versus all the number of transactions. So support for tomato is it occurs four times and there are total eight transactions, so it's four by eight. Now confidence is uh, essentially saying when tomato occurs, of all the instances that tomato occurs, how many instances beer also occurs. So it's support for this divided by support for these two, meaning how many times this combination occurs versus how many times it occurs, yeah. yeah. And, and lift is you know, just the support of, of the two times, support of one and the support of one. So this essentially gives you the probability of how frequently they occur together, so you can strategize, you know, be it your products or, uh, you know, how to market your products. All right, 
So we have seen a bunch of uh, machine learning techniques, right? So how do different companies use machine learning techniques for their own business problems? Um, some of the interesting uh, use cases are educational institutions uh, use machine learning to check plagiarism on the basis of similarity of documents. That's scary, right? Because all our, all, all the, if all the professors had access to this tool, then there is, then every, every submission has to be unique now. So that's an interesting use case. Uh, in home security systems, right, they use machine learning uh, to kind of build a catalog of all the of the all the frequently visiting users. So every time a visitor comes up who doesn't match that catalog, then it will identify them as you know uninvited guests or thieves, burglars, or whatnot. Um, oil and gas companies, right, huge. Uh, it's a huge uh, business case for them, trying to identify um, locations or areas where they can find these uh, resources even before they can. Right, that's a, that's a huge use case for them. Airline industry, right? Um, they use machine learning for, of course, for predicting demand, um, finding optimal routes, and then all the dynamic pricing. The, the ticket or the price that you get today is not the same that you get a week later because as demand rises, they, they increase the price too. So they use that dynamically and you know, machine learning is what goes behind it. Um, the other uh, sophisticated rather uh, use cases using robots for surgical procedures. Right? This is both scary and exciting. I mean, you're scared for your life, but then you've programmed, you've seen the repeatable procedure enough that the robot can now learn uh, from from the experiences that it has seen in the past and can execute on those. So these are some of the use cases that different companies are using for machine learning. Now you might say that, well, I don't work for any of these companies. You know, I know nothing about these. So you know, why should it matter to me? All right. So. What's the first thing we all do, mostly, when we wake up, you know, with one of your eye open? You try to reach for your phone, right, most of the times, and then the first thing that you see is Facebook, right? And guess how many ways Facebook uses machine learning? When it, it shows you the ads that are relevant to you. You search something very recently on Google, on Yahoo, or wherever, and suddenly you see ads for it on Facebook. So Facebook knows what you're searching for. And based on what you what you search for, it kind of customizes those ads for you. Similarly, the content, the kind of content you are shown is different from what your friend is shown. Again, there's a lot of customization happening to your interests. Right? Well, also, if you've seen the tagging, right? Whenever you upload a picture, if there are your friends in the picture, it knows who those friends are, it suggests that you tag that person. A lot of neural networks going on behind the scene. Uh, Google recently, I think it's been a year now, uh, came up with this smart reply. Right? Have, you, have any of you seen this in your emails? Right? Based on the content in your email, it somehow knows to formulate those three options which are very relevant and which are most frequently the, the options we would use, right? Amazon. We all shop on Amazon. Right? You often see this frequently brought together, right? The classic example of association, market basket that we were talking about, where you group products and you know when you make the suggestion, you know most of the times people are interested in it. So you know, most of the times we get carried away and buy the whole bunch that, that uh, Amazon is recommending. It also does, customers who brought this also brought this. Okay, so it's, it's, this is what happens most of the time. This is again, trying to identify uh, items that occur frequently. Association rules, right? Ubers, right? All the, all the price surging that we see based on time of the day, traffic, demand, you know, a lot of a uh, lot of machine learning happening behind the scene. Fraudulent transaction. This actually happened to me recently. 
So we went out for a uh, shop in a mall, and then on our way back, we stopped by a gas station. And uh, suddenly we get this message saying, oh, there was a transaction made at this, at this gas station. And there was something suspicious about it because the gas station that we were at was not the same gas station that we got the message from. And then we called the bank, sure enough, they said, oh, your card has been compromised. Somebody already made transactions, you know, transactions in smaller amounts. Nowadays, hackers are very smart too. If you, if you did a transaction for a thousand, ten thousand dollars, obviously it's going to be on the radar of the bank. So they made tiny little transactions, got multiple of them. So that you know, we often set your limits to 100 or you know, 200 for, for for your message to appear, right? So this was something that happened, and then you know, banks kind of know how to how to alert for anomaly anomaly detection, right? So based on the frequency of uh, of your transactions, based on the location, time of the day, and you know, they have they have machine learning algorithms always trying to identify if there's anything suspicious about it. movies. Netflix somehow magically knows what you will be interested in. And 8 out of 10 times you are going to go by the recommendation that Netflix gives you, right? So in a way, Netflix is kind of controlling what you will be viewing. You know, huge use case for, for machine learning. And at the end of the day, after all the Facebooking, shopping and movies, when you when you talk to Siri and tell it to, to set an alarm for the next day, it's essentially converting your speech to, to actions where behind the scenes it's natural language processing. So my point here is you might love machine learning or hate machine learning, but you know it's, it's, it's very difficult to kind of ignore it because it has become such an integral part of all of So, with all the cool things that we can do with machine learning, you know, it's, 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 you know, some of us are kind of thinking, okay, I either need to be a machine learning data scientist so I can do all these cool things, or hire a machine learning data scientist so they can do all these cool things for us as, as companies, as organizations, and, and you know, and countries, right? So, again, the definition of uh, machine learning data scientists kind of varies with people. In general, uh, data scientists, as a data scientist, uh, when there is a role of a data scientist, they usually are expected to kind of uh, carry forward the, with the entire process of machine learning, right from data ingestion, right from collecting data to preparing data, building models, validating it, and then you know, retraining the models. Right? This is the cycle that machine learn that usually data scientists are expected to do. But I think that when you say machine learning data scientists, uh, there is, I think, a certain uh, increased focus on just building the models, right? So somebody who's, who's, who's very adept at uh, all the different machine learning algorithms, um, you know, different parameters for those algorithms, how to how to apply different types of techniques. So I think, I think somebody who has a larger focus and some more interested in uh, just the model building part. That's what I see as machine learning data scientists. And before you hire a machine learning data scientist, I think uh, the one very important thing is to have the buy-in of your senior leadership. And this is true for you know, any type of machine learning and any type of uh, new, <coughs> new innovative projects that you want to do. You, know, you can build the most fanciest model in the world show all the potential ROI, but if, 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 the, if, the, if the leadership is not convinced and if they don't embrace that uh, culture of data-driven decision-making, I think uh, you, you don't go anywhere. So before hiring a machine learning data scientist, first make sure that, that you know, your senior leadership actually appreciates the value of data-driven decision-making. Also some of the things to keep in mind are to make sure that your data science problems are actually clearly defined, so you can get the maximum value when the data scientist comes in. Right? Um, the heart and soul of 
all things data science and machine learning is data. Right? So, so, we, we, we want to make sure we have enough 